Okay. Are we, there we go, we're active. Thank you very much. So first off, my sincere gratitude to the organizers and to everyone here for attending this presentation. So today I'd like to share with you guys one of my empirical data-driven projects. It's a fairly small scale project at this point, but one that I think can make a difference to a particular group of people, as I'll talk about. It is grounded in critical race theory, and I rely on it to study the lived realities of tutors. Tutors in the context of this study are contractually appointed part-time teachers at a South African university. They are sometimes called teaching assistants in other contexts. So all of them are enrolled for a master's degree in addition to their teaching. So they must balance teaching with their own research. But it is their teaching role that I think makes them relevant to critical race theory. And the tutors I'm talking about here are specifically employed to guide first year students or freshmen through theorizations of racism as systemic in the context of an introductory module in literary studies that was designed for this purpose. So I'm curious about the way these tutors can reflect on their relationships with students and how they might build resilience alongside these students as they walk them through very serious matters like racism. My central point of departure here is twofold. First, there are many critical race theoretic studies that advocate for teaching students to conceptualize racism as something that is systemic, intersectional, and contemporary. Instead of limiting racism to individual prejudice or distant histories that we are all done with. So critical race theory promotes pedagogies that equip students to read their own lived experiences in relation to broader systems of racialized power. Second, there are many CRT studies that examine the lived experiences of students, but my attempt to contribute is focused on tutors and how they help students to think through what it means to contend that racism is systemic. So I conducted interviews with tutors aiming to discern the discourses they use to assign meaning to their teaching experiences with students. And I use critical race theory to think about the tutor-student relationship as spaces where critical consciousness about racism can be collaboratively developed and deepened, but also as spaces where the unequal power relations within which higher education inevitably transpires can be reproduced. So to gain purchase on the discourses that tutors produced during the interviews, I rely on the psychoanalytic concept mentalization as theorized by Kennedy and Young. So in the rest of this presentation, I'm briefly going to outline how Kennedy and Young approach mentalization, and I will explicate why I consider it productive for this topic. After that, I share some of my primary findings as interpreted via the concept mentalization. Now, mentalization reflects modes of psychic experience in relation to race as facilitated by different kinds of discursive practices in which the internal world is experienced as being separate from, but nonetheless related to external reality. And I contend that mentalization can open a fruitful window on the student-tutor relationship and their dynamic by theorizing inner or traditionally psychological and external or traditionally social worlds as always interpenetrating each other. Because this is the fundamental point of departure for the field of psychosocial studies. The psychological and the social aspects of experience are always locked in mutually constitutive relationships. But you might ask, how does this principle relate to the study of racism in an introductory module in literary studies? What does it have to do with the work that tutors undertake with students? Well, critical race theory offers a framework that can be combined with psychosocial studies to try and measure 
healthy or compromised mentalization in relation to race. So for example, if during the interviews, tutors are asked to reflect on their teaching experiences with students, to what extent are they willing and able to reflect on something like systemic racism, not simply as something that occurs over there at a distance with policymakers, but as a social force that impacts their own teaching processes as a structure in which the teaching process is inevitably situated so that it mediates students' experience of the learning process. In other words, can tutors situate their own experiences of and observations of the teaching process in relation to external systems? Can they appreciate that interconnectedness between the internal and external? Exactly what do the discourses look like through which tutors create meaning around their experiences with students? And what can an, an analysis of these discourses contribute to critical race theory? So these are some of the questions that shaped my use of the concept mentalization. But let me clarify exactly what it is that mentalization offers to a discourse analysis of interviews grounded in critical race theory. So on the one hand, it underscores both the social discursively constructed nature of mental experience and the mutually constitutive interpenetration between the inner subjective and the outer social. It views our minds as filters of our experience, which can be curious and reflective, but also rigid and defensive. In more concrete terms, analytically, mentalization enables a reading of interview data along two lines. The degree to which interviewees are able to frame the inner and outer aspects of experience as mutually constitutive, and second, more importantly, the degree to which interviewees can consider the implications of this entanglement for making sense of experience. In other words, interviewees' appreciation of this relationship between the inner subjective and outer social is something that can sharpen or stymie mentalization. Now let me link this to questions of race and racism specifically. Critical mentalization can recognize and reflect on the complex entwinements between individual and interpersonal aspects of racism, as well as the systemic dimensions of racism. So for example, if students in a classroom appear reluctant to talk about racism, then sound mentalization would avoid individualizing, decontextualizing, or depoliticizing that kind of reluctance by factoring for the systems that mediate students' participation in learning. Now, Kennedy and Young illustrate such dynamics, but in a very different context than mine. They interrogate the meaning-making practices used by white trainee clinical psychologists who evince a discourse of racial innocence. Essentially, these white trainee psychologists picture their therapeutic relationships with black clients as unsullied by racism, simply because clients never mention racism openly. So this stance compromises mentalization by overlooking how a personal defensive investment in a discourse of racial innocence stymies an understanding of therapeutic relationships, well, of all relationships, as inevitably shaped by prevailing social conditions and systems. In short, mentalization is curtailed when the impression that racism is absent from the immediate interpersonal context is accepted unquestioningly without engaging evidence that society remains racialized and stratified, certainly in the South African context. Analytically speaking, then, my argument is that this theorization of mentalization impels an understanding that the discourses research participants employ during interviews can expand and or impede a grasp of internal and external worlds as inherently enmeshed. So for example, do tutors depoliticize students by individualizing and decontextualizing their reluctance to talk about racism? Because this reluctance from students, at least an initial level of reluctance, was a finding 
that emerged from all of the tutors that I interviewed. So are students, for example, framed as academically deficient because they won't engage racism intellectually in these classes? Are tutors able to question their own meaning-making processes? Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to assume that the core precepts of critical race theory are generally known, but during the Q&A, I am more than happy to answer questions about precisely how CRT drove the conceptualization and operationalization of my study. Right, the tutors who participated in my study drew my attention because they are responsible for this kind of work, for helping first-year students to think about racism as systemic by means of literary texts on the issue. How do they do this? What are some of the successes and obstacles they experience? So I interviewed 15 tutors, which was the full complement employed for 2021 and 2022. Now, each tutor is responsible for conducting discussions with groups of 20 to 25 students on a weekly basis for a full semester, and they are all trained to use pedagogic techniques that are intended to stimulate active participation from students, to recognize students as co-producers of knowledge around racial identity and experiences of racism. I'm happy to say more about the tutor's work during the Q&A, and I would also be happy to say more about my interview procedures, but right now I'd like to share some of the primary findings that emerged from the interviews. And I'm going to focus on the way the tutors who identify as black women discursively constructed their own intersectional positionalities vis-a-vis -vis students because a number of important commonalities emerged here. As I mentioned before, the concept mentalization highlights how tutors attend to the mutually constitutive interplay between inner and outer aspects of experience while assigning meaning to encounters with students. And tutors who self-identify as black women reflect on this enmeshment by situating the students they work with in a broader institutional context. And these reflections emerged when the tutors explained how they stimulate conversation among students. For example, I get them, that is students, to participate by asking provocative questions like, are characters, in the text of the student study, are characters poor because they are black or because they are lazy? These questions provoke opinions, especially from black students. I do think the fact that students see me as a black woman lets me show them they are allowed to share what they think instead of having to censor themselves, which I think they learn to do elsewhere on campus. I ask difficult questions to show students that talking is okay because I don't think that is true everywhere on campus. For example, why are some characters made to feel like they don't belong in certain spaces? How does that speak to real life? It takes students a long time to start saying openly that it is racialized, but I think being seen by students as a black woman gives me more legitimacy. So these tutors engage the intersectional positionalities which they believe students assign to them. Being identified as black women, they believe students are more likely to accept them as authorities on racism because they can speak from experiential knowledge. This approach contrasts sharply with participants in Kennedy and Young who leverage a discourse of racial innocence which disconnects interpersonal interactions from broader socio-political issues affecting South Africa. The tutor's reflections on how to actively involve students in creating knowledge locates the exchange in a wider institutional context through which they foreground the likelihood that students' experiences elsewhere on campus might have predisposed them to censor themselves. And this observation aligns with extensive CRT research, suggesting that students often learn that deliberations about racism on campus spaces should be avoided or kept superficial. 
mindful of this contextual embeddedness, these tutors respond by proactively venturing into potentially uncomfortable terrain. They use provocative and difficult questions to stimulate students into responding. Now given their authority as tutors, who are responsible for setting the tone of the conversation, venturing into these contentious areas might help to normalize candid engagement with topics that could be censured outside tutorials. Said differently, instead of decontextualizing and depoliticizing students' behavior, the tutors appreciate that students might need permission to openly discuss issues like racism owing to institutional arrangements that discourage candor. In their own words, this is the first module where students are allowed to link personal experience with texts on racism. So I need to show them it is permitted. It took until the middle of the semester for students to believe that I really wanted to hear their honest opinions. In some of their writing, students do say how they know what the characters go through is real because similar things happen to them. I did encourage them openly to elaborate on those links, but only if they are comfortable sharing, because sharing might be too intense in some cases, I think. I don't think they would have done if I had not invited it. So in terms of mentalization, this emphasis on giving students permission to discuss racism reflects a recognition that individual students work under structural impediments which requires the tutors model critical candor and sensitivity to students. It shows a dual awareness that the tutor-student relationship is impacted both by such broader structures and the positionalities from which tutors speak, including racialized and gendered subjectivities. As such, these tutors acknowledge that students may have been enculturated to accept self-censorship and the tutors attempt to mitigate this censorship. However, the intersectional subject positions from which they work also incites resistance. But that advantage of being a black woman who says provocative things only applies to my black students. White students don't take so well with the way I go about discussions. They find me exhausting and go silent. So. During this portion of the interview, this tutor discusses the vulnerability that she experiences when she attempts to prompt white students to collaborate with black peers as they co-develop knowledge. But she also acknowledges the vulnerability that white students might experience, thus positioning herself as both affecting and affected by them. Subsequently, she interprets this affectively charged response as follows. It's difficult to mediate between black students who are a majority in my groups and who respond as if I have given them permission to finally share what they are thinking and white students. It's unnerving for me when they go silent. But I think they feel like they can't participate because they don't think or feel what black students do so they think they won't be heard. I don't know how to bring them out of that because I do want to hear from them. Now on the one hand, proposing that white students struggle when encountering knowledge about racism certainly accords with critical race theory. However, in terms of mentalization, her meaning-making efforts around white students show less nuance than her insight into black students' reactions to provocative questions, since she does not embed white students' silence in a richer context that could and should have included white privilege. Now, critical race theoretic projects in South Africa and elsewhere have documented how institutions of higher learning tacitly prioritize the affective comfort of white students by means of institutionalized whiteness. It is therefore possible that many white students only encounter this level of candor around racism during these tutorials. Moreover, 
This encounter between white students and theorizations of racism is facilitated by black women tutors who pose provocative questions. And under such conditions, silence may constitute a power evasive reaction. And yet, such considerations are absent from interviews with the tutors who identify as black women. However, to make sense of this, I must also implicate myself and the interview context. As Kennedy and Young stress, interviews constitute sites where knowledge is discursively co-produced, which mediates the capacity to mentalize. As the interviewer, I could have supported deeper exploration, prompting the tutors to weigh more nuanced accounts for white students' silence and apparent withdrawal. This in turn could have sharpened insight into white privilege while also resisting a homogenized and homogenizing reading of white students. Instead, my interviews with these tutors concentrated more heavily on their experiences with black students. Fortunately for me, the tutors who identify as black women pointed this out to me during post-interview debriefing sessions. And in response, they broached a series of more nuanced and textured readings. Overall, however, many of the reflections voiced by these tutors showcased a more pronounced and developed capacity for mentalization compared to tutors who identify as white. Again, I'm happy to discuss these and other themes during the Q&A and to engage with many other errors I probably made during the interview process. But in the interest of time, I'm going to stop here hoping that this brief overview of the study has given you a sense of what it might contribute to critical race theory. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we can dedicate 10 minutes to questions and answers and comments, so I'll be passing the microphone to our colleagues here, and I see the first and second voice. <laughs> thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you both for your presentations. I had maybe mainly for the first presenter, but also the second one is where is the systemic uh, uh, question in the in the presentation? I mean, there's a. You know, I agree, of course, with the importance of empathy and 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 uh, and proximity but the critique on the, the 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 theory of andries bart has of course been that it's very especially in his earlier work been very relational rather than structural and it's of course a critique on the notion of resilience itself as as being uh, called a, a neoliberal notion because we we shift responsibility of an unjust society to youngsters who have to get stronger and resist and be resilient in 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 the face of great injustice. And the same with race dealing with racism in, interrelationally, which I, I agree is highly important. But also there's of course a systemic element in also in our educational systems. And I was wondering how do you link because it's not one or the other of course they both are important but how do you link this uh, or how do you prevent that the answer to these questions doesn't become something that is the responsibility of youngsters themselves alone and also of the, the greater societal context yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely brilliant question absolutely and, and you're spot on with the, the context in which resiliency empathy all of these really all the social emotional learning you know context of education has been framed in um, there's a few things that we've done um, as we as we first developed the uh, empathy curriculum um, as, as any good academics did we looked around to see what we could steal and um, what we found is there was only two or three empathy empathy education programs out there so we really had to go back to basics and uh, just did a massive systematic review, did piloting, did all sorts of things. Um, ended up doing a randomized control trial, all sorts of things, with the idea of not passing the blame or the burden onto young people. Uh, as, as we talked with schools and school administrators and teachers, everyone said this is a lovely idea, but I can't take on another course or module. I'm already overburdened. It's, you know, I agree with you, it's fine. The other thing we heard quite often is, um, yes, in a, in a 
uh, a social science or a civics course, um, this makes perfect sense. But how could you ever have empathy in maths? You know, and uh, for someone who struggled with math, I can tell you how you need empathy in maths. Uh, but so that led us to like two different tracks of this. Um, actually, three. Um, you know, we, we've set up the program to be very dynamic, so it can uh, be delivered in formal and non-formal settings with youth. But the other big piece, and this this again goes back to the comment about maths and, and this sort of stuff. Um, our big push now is also to have it simultaneously embedded with teacher education. So, you know, the way I teach as a teacher is informed by by empathy. It's it's you know I, I hang my teaching points on the stories I tell, the connections, of things like that. Um, but it's very much a two-way street. That it's that it's not placing the burden on young people. Um, now, I will say, structurally, we've had a very, working with, with Anna and others within UNESCO, um, and because of the research, I mean, else, um, starting next, next autumn, um, empathy education is going to be mandated in all Irish schools as part of the curriculum. Um, so it's, it's actually being kind of structurally moved into it as a, a specific skill that's needed. Um, and I, I agree with you completely. It's not passing the responsibility onto them. But I think it's more, you know, the work we do with, with UNESCO, with OECD, these, these inter international organizations, in the last decade or so, they've become very clear that education systems and everything else is much more than providing a, a narrow skill set to get you a job. That we need the social emotional aspects um, to navigate the world we're in, not just for ourselves, but for others. So that's sort of, you know, we can, we can talk more about it, but that's sort of the big picture of how we've tried to get it into structural levels and you know one of the things we hope to do with Anna and, and others at UNESCO is to try and find places where this could be have the most impact but it'll be culturally different and everything else so um, we might yeah. there's a Belgian philosopher who wrote a book Beyond Empathy where he says that empathy is not a good basis to build your <laughs> the social system on because it only gives us attention for the people we kind of but maybe I Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. And actually, I have, I have a very good colleague in um, psychology professor, and uh, has a whole empathy lab related to psychology, and he's he's always telling me I'm way too optimistic that there's a dark side to empathy, that there's there's this. So, uh, yeah, you're, yeah, we have to talk over lunch. <laughs> Okay, again, I just want to reiterate what my colleague said. It is a fantastic question. So I'm going to offer one answer that is problematic, and then I'll offer a second answer that is marginally better. So the first answer is this. Where is the systemic in the way this, this, this module unfolds and how the analysis unfolds? At one level, it's in the literary text that students engage. So you have a range of novels that students have to work through, and those novels have been selected because they problematize the idea that racism is an irrational reaction from a minority of prejudiced individuals, all right? Um, and once students seem like they can resonate with this and they can feel, well, but I have experienced something that I could not label as racism earlier, and now I feel that I can and I'm allowed to talk about it in an institutional context, Perhaps there's a degree of liberation that happens there. But of course the problem there is that this is being done in a broader institution and you're foisting a lot of the affective labor onto the tutors. They are the ones who have to build resilience, they are the ones who have to work, walk students through this very contentious, highly personal work while the institution at large could remain unchanged in many ways. That's one of my concerns. One of my other concerns also is that I, I, am, I have an abiding concern with the, with the normative use of white and black and how we use these categories without adequately problematizing them for students. But these are first year students. Getting them to grapple with intersectionality is already difficult. You know, walking them through how identity is socially constructed at this level is also very difficult. Now, the slightly marginally better answer is that if what I, one of the things I'm trying to establish with this research is to showcase the kind of affective labor the tutors, under, they're not really called tutors, I just use it here because 
for various reasons. But if we can showcase the kind of work they do, we can also secure better funding so that they are better supported and that other um, departments across campuses begin to not only use the system, but to direct their work towards systemic issues so that students more broadly can at least talk about it. And the next step for me is to start looking at other forms of assessment. Because it's one thing to engage students in this kind of work, but ultimately they are still being assessed with the same kind of um, scholarly essays that many of them find alienating and marginalizing. So if, if you have concerns about the ultimate utility of the research, then I share many of your concerns. And I'm, I'm open to suggestions for how to um, improve the critical drive of this work. I wanted to follow up on uh, the criticism of uh, empathy. Um, there's another book, uh, Against Empathy on Rational Compassion. Um, and the argument uh, goes that if you define empathy as uh, understanding and sharing emotions and feelings, uh, then actually you're doing something almost impossible and not really necessary because you don't need to, you, you don't need to and you shouldn't um, share the feelings of the person that you want to support because it makes you, it actually harder to, to help. So for example, if my friend's mother dies, I will not be able to feel for him or to feel the same as he does because he's not my mother. But I want to understand his feelings and remind him that, you know, I'm here for him, I, I will help him and I will help him to overcome those emotions, it's, but there are other things in life and so on. So I don't want to really feel the same as if my own mother died, right? So what, what would be your response to, to this argument? Why actually we need empathy and not, for example, rational compassion? Again, another wonderful question, yeah. I, I think there's a couple dimensions to it. Um, one, you know, in terms of, of the, there's a growing body of literature on empathy fatigue that, you know, we do want to be supportive for those we love. We do want to be supportive of our students and we do uh, want to take on some of the burden that they're carrying. Um, and I, I agree with you and I think that does sort of fall into the, the sort of, uh, actually both of what you said uh, can fall into sort of the dark side of it. Um, the main way we've been focusing on it has been more in terms of, um, kind of countering the differences amongst us. So, you know, if, if you and I are just completely opposite side of everything, socially, politically, whatever, you know, um, you know, hopefully we become friends, but we, we don't have to be friends, but I can at least understand, you know, from a, from a leadership standpoint, from other things, where you're coming from. And maybe we can find some, some common ground. We can find some, certainly find some things to agree to disagree on, but we can also realize there's some common general areas. Uh, so I think we've been focusing more on that way. And um, a lot of the, uh, the youth programs that have self-identified topics um, have gone more in the areas of social justice type things. So trying to understand why people would be, how do you reach out to someone who's been doing homophobic bullying? How do you, how do you try and find some common ground here to get us to understand each other so there's, there's not the conflict side? Um, but you're right, there's no, there's no clear path to this. And I, and I agree that there are th these dimensions of it that, um, yeah, I mean, it's for, for us to take on the burden of someone who's going through things that are horrible. Um, you know, that, that, that dramatically goes the opposite direction. Doesn't enhance our well-being. So yeah, I, I, I agree. Okay, so I think we will, come to an end of this part of our program today. Um, whilst I'll uh, try to pull out the new website that we're launching today, and I would like to invite to the floor Dr. Cecilia Shogun from University of Buenos Aires, our visiting professor and now also working at our UNESCO chair at uh, the Maria Grzegorzewska University.